Hola, ¿qué tal, you guys? It's Vanessa with Reventoni Mas, but today we're actually going to be doing something a little different. We are starting a brand new series where we're going to be looking at different political candidates across the spectrum. And today I have a very, very special guest with me, Mr. Clarendon. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Appreciate you. Thank I you. I know Clarendon Johnston, correct? Yes. Awesome. I prefer Clay. You can call Clay. me Clarendon, though. That's fine. I will call you Clay. That's fine. Clay, thank you. Clay works out better for me anyway. Yes. So. <laughs> I'm really actually happy to have you here. Now, even though your um, your um, candidate, bleh, your election doesn't even come in until 2022, so right. you have a lot right. of time. You're at the very, very beginning of your you know political race. Right. And I was looking at like some of your policies, and I was looking at how you're actually rolling. And you, by far, it is very clear that you're not a typical political candidate. Um, you. Are actually a, um, a championship winning football coach who yes. is going into LA City Council. So yes. tell me, why go from coaching football to a city council? What made you want to do that? Um, just just in, in part in caring about people, caring about youth, caring about the community. Um, it's no different than somebody that just wants to help and give back. Um, it's been a passion of mine. I love the community that I was raised in and, and, I, and, I, and I work in. So giving back to it after after so many years of being a part of the community, well, what else do you want to leave behind as a legacy? You being a part of the community, that's your job. You should participate in, in whatever activities your community needs or whatever help it needs to improve. For sure. Now, when I first met you, it was, I believe it was about a little bit of over a week or so. Right. Um, I spoke to you briefly because right. I just wanted to get to know you a little bit. And the first thing you told me is that you are not a politician. Right but you're going into the political shark tank, if right, you will. Right. So does that concern you at all whenever you're going into this race with potential other candidates who have been in this before? It, it did. The only concern was the people around me, not so much myself uh, in the sense, if I was to say myself, it was the concern about, yeah, I'm entering the world that I have no idea about other than I've heard about, read about, studied about. But as I, as I look into it each day, politics isn't everything we do. Um, but yet, at the end of the day, I'm not a politician. Really don't like the, the aspect of having to come on and tell people actually what we're doing or, or uh, how we're going about it. I'm more of an action person, even though I know there's some people that can't see and they're not out there with you, so they're not aware. But definitely um, far from a politician. And as far as going against them in that aspect, that's no worry. I mean, I, I feel I have a better opportunity in the sense of I'm more in touch with the community, I'm closer to the community, I'm more visual with the community, and that's something that I would want from our politicians or the people that are in charge of our cities, to actually be out in the community so people can see them visually, so they feel like whatever they were, their concerns were, the politicians or the people that are in charge of their communities in that sense are actually out and about thinking about, looking at, and asking the people in those communities their concerns, comments, or whatever it may be. So would you say that rather than being a politician, you are more a potential public servant? Yeah, you would say that community organizer, community activist in that sense, not so much a politician, definitely not, because it, it definitely that stigma as well, especially with our younger kids and, and, and looking at the world and what's going on in front of them and hearing their parents about past politics. Yeah, I do want to change that stigma because I can't escape the fact that it's politics is the game that I'm in. But the, as far as to go to play the game, the suit, and having this conversation with you is as far as I'll go. I don't. I, I definitely won't be influenced by anything other than the community and the people that live in that community. Well, I'm glad you're, you know, willing to go as far as talking to me. No, definitely. Appreciate that. Definitely. I appreciate um, that. So, as far as your policies go, right. I was looking through your social media. I was obviously, you know, doing my research, and I found that while you do have a very big tent in the sense of, you know, you're looking at police reform, immigration reform, um, public health, quite a few different things. Right. Um, I noticed more than anything, public health seems to be your top one whenever right. we're looking at, you know, the current spectrum and the current analysis of your social media. Public public health is tip top of the list. Right. So would you say that that comes from your history of coaching football and working with youth or where would that come from? I would have to say that would come from my, my father. <laughs> my father lived to be uh, 94 years old. He passed away about a year and a half ago, but he, he, he wasn't so much a health nut in the sense of uh, he's looking at magazines and getting information on how to eat and the nutrition here and there. He just he was just really observant about what he put into his body. That's your temple. So whatever you put in, you're going to get out of your body. So with that, with that being said, I noticed that in the inner city, you know, healthier food is, is pushed upon people, but it's not 
cost effective for those people that are in the lower income area. So if you're if you're a leader in those areas and there's youth and there's people in those communities that usually don't get the information that they should about how they should eat and take care of their bodies, well, that's something that we want to be informative about. You know, there's a healthier uh, way to live life. There's healthier options. And then we also want to implement plans into the community once we dig into office to where those expensive, healthy menus that we do see in our communities, let's try to talk to the owners and try to find a meal or a plan to where the lower income people that live in that same community where these expensive restaurants are as far as vegan and plant-based are, that the lower income people can eat healthy and afford those as well. Of course. Now, while yes, you are, you know, at the very, very early stages of this political race, right. what are your plans for that? Right. As, as far as, as now, it's doing something I'm uncomfortable with. That's being on camera and telling people my, my agendas and my object, objectives and platforms. I, I'm more of a person that's always just been out in the community doing the work. Never really been out in the community to do the work so people can see me and then see me in that light and translate, oh, he does do things. Well, there's people that put on suits. There's people that get out into the community and, and take pictures and do videos, but they actually don't do the work. So I'm in the infancy of, of letting people know who I am, getting my platform on my agenda out there. As you said, there's a broad base of things that I believe in, which is, I believe a lot of our concerns is people that live in the communities. Um, but homelessness, um, police reform, um, rent control, um, just just overall, out of all of the things, those are the things. And, and also, like you said, you know, community and public health are things that we really, really want to focus on, whatever is being left out of our inner city communities. Definitely. Now, I'm actually really glad you brought up police reform. Whenever I was doing my research on you, I did see that there were some photos, you know, of, you know, at protests. Right, and right. definitely, would you say, you know, Black Lives Matter and everything like in that sense, you would be a supporter of, no doubt? Oh, no, definitely. Black Lives Matter more than anything. Not more than anything. I shouldn't say it in that matter. But two. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Black Lives Matter. Yes, I support that. But you also saw photos with me where I was with law enforcement and I was doing work with law enforcement and I've done work with law enforcement. So I'm somebody who does understand that there's a there's a tough, tough line to, to, to actually straddle because there are good officers out there. I know them, I've met them, I've worked with them, I've done community active, activism with them. But then again, there's our officers that I've been pulled over by for absolutely nothing or just being parked and being asked questions that you shouldn't be asked. And I obviously have to tie that to the color of my skin because I don't know too many of my other friends that have been parked and the police officers walk over and ask if you have any warrants or any probation, or, are you okay? Usually, are you okay should be the first question instead of are you uh, on probation or do you have any warrants? Now, me being African-American and grow, growing up in a Latino community, I when it comes to, to police brutality or the, the alertness of police and, and the things that go on in the community, I've seen it on both ends. So I can't just say um, it's only happened to black people. It's happened to all people of color when it comes to law enforcement. So I do want to support everybody in that aspect, which is a tough thing to do because you want to support the police because we need them to, to keep our community safe. But we also want to bring to light that, hey, there's a problem here and we need to bring the problem to light. And it's not just happening to one class or, or one, one um, certain type of people but a whole broad space of people that are of color. Yeah, definitely. Um, I appreciate that you actually bring up that it doesn't just happen to black like, people, but it does happen to all minorities. Right. Um, I know that for a lot of people, whenever it comes to Black Lives Matter, their concern is that they feel that they are being left out. And that's very a very, very common notion in the Latino community. Right. So would you say that as far as with Black Lives Matter as, and any other minorities, would you be open to being able to push even though their main focus is with Black Lives Matter, those same policies, mindsets with, you know, the Latinos, the, the Asian community, any other minority community, would you say you would? Oh, definitely. I don't, that's why that was, I kind of, I get lost when I get asked those questions because I am African American and I grew up in a predominantly Latino community and then I went to school where there was a melting pot of nationalities. So I, 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 I know it's a cliche, I really don't see color, even though I do see color, mm -hmm. but growing up and I was the only person that was of color at a, a lot of the functions at school or whatever it may be, um, that was just something that never really came up in my household. My father didn't teach me to see anybody other than actually their, their energy, their spirit, who they are, and how they treat others. Like the color of their skin, it didn't really, it didn't really translate to me until someone else made me aware of that I was different. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. So I want to go over maybe a couple more topics with you before we get out of here. Um, one that I really, really want to talk to you about, you were talking about rent control and homelessness. Right. And we have been in a very, very tough housing crisis nationally for years. Right. This is something that is not new. Right. So if you were to go into city council, right. what would you want to do differently to be able to make those changes? Because we see so many people who have careers and still can't even afford to live on their own. Right because of, and that's just here in LA, and we're not even considering other states. I've seen so many other families where they're living in hotels because they can't afford to find a place, right. or there's such a shortage right. to find somewhere to live that they live in a hotel room. Right. So what would you want to do differently if you were to take that seat? Now, the difference in my in my seat that that's more of almost like a Congress and a Senate thing when it comes to that. No, but on the local level. On the local level, okay. On the local level, I, I definitely would push for services, especially for the homeless first. Let's figure out why they're even out there on the streets and why they're homeless. So that doesn't mean they're not criminals automatically. Let's send some social worker, workers out there. Let's be consistent about the so, social workers. Also, let's get away from all of the red tape. There's a bunch of people that are homeless. They seek services, but then they're, they're told they need to call this other this other service. And then they're told they need it. So the wraparound takes sometimes months, sometimes a year. So I, I would try to speed up every single process that is available statewide, local-wide, and, and maybe even tap into federal if we could, if we could re receive resources from there and get everybody that I can to get in these places and talk to the actual people about their their background, about their record, about drug use, about housing, about employment, whatever specific thing has caused them to be out there, we need to have people pinpointing that. And then the, the next tough thing is these people are homeless. So there have been groups that have gone out to try to talk to people and keep up with them, but homeless means you're homeless. So you can be one place one day, and then the next day circumstances drive you to be somewhere else and not actually in that place. So the social workers can come back, but there's not anyone there for them to go back to to keep up with and keep track with and say, hey, I got this job offer, I got this job interview, here's a place to go get your hair cut, you know, so on and so forth. So along with that, I would, I would also say there's people like you said that are just on the fence, um, they have a job, but the job doesn't, you know, allow them uh, enough to pay the rent where they're at. So I think that's where us as, as city leaders need to talk about, let's, the, the, let's increase you know, the minimum wage uh, uh, so people can actually afford to live in the communities that they're working in. It doesn't make sense that more than 75% of their income is going towards their rent. So what else do they have money to spend on for the rest of the month? Um, the, the reason why that's such a funny and, and, a, and a weird topic is because there's no real quick, brief answer for that. Mm -hmm. To me, we need FEMA. To me, it should be treated like a natural disaster. Um, to where the federal government comes in, they're bringing in all their resources, they're setting up, and they're helping uh, the situation. There's a bunch of initiatives, there's a lot that people are doing, but it seems like they're, they've taken so long to just get to the point to start doing it. So that's another thing. If we see it, we want to start acting on it immediately. We don't want to sit back and say, there's only a few, and then the next thing you know, you look up and three months later, it's blown out of proportion where now you're getting calls, you're getting complaints, and there's not much you can do because you're acting late. So I don't want to act like I have a simple answer to that because that's, that's a tough answer. But I, I do know that I would work extremely hard to get everyone the services that we have allotted and get them the right services that, that they actually need upon their situations because every single homeless person doesn't have the same problem. For sure. Definitely love your answer. That was very, very insightful. Um, I'm sure for everyone watching at home, you guys, those of you who are watching who have been in this situation, I'm sure this is something that is a big concern. So thank you so much for, you know, giving us your insight on that. Now, our final topic that I want to talk to you about, one topic that is always, always, always so important in the Latino community is immigration. Right. Now, you are on the local level. So while that isn't something that we typically see, you know, with our local public servants, right. we do see that at times, you know, in some certain areas, the local government does help with ICE. And right. unfortunately, that ends up in some very, very, very sticky and very uncomfortable situations for all involved. So what is your mindset when it comes to working with ICE and helping with you know, the local dreamers and people who are trying to actually make something of their lives here, right. even though they are immigrants. Right. The, the fact that you're an immigrant, I mean, if you look at it, pretty much everyone in the United States would be considered an immigrant. Um, 
it, it, as I've been getting into it more and learning about it more, even though I grew up in the Latino community, it wasn't something we really talked about, you know, growing up. It was more of a, a threat than to talk about. So um, with that being said, most of the, the people that I know that are immigrants work extremely hard. Um, they pay their taxes. They try to raise their families and, and they try to do everything they can to abide by our laws. So I guess the, while they're taking care of their paperwork, a red flag isn't brought up upon them. Um, that's why they have a problem. If, if someone's here and they're, they're busting their butt and they're taking care of their family and they're doing everything in their, in their strength and their possibilities that they can to make sure that the family has a better life and you're using their taxes from what they're producing here in our, in our, in our country that they want to come and be a part of, then they should be treated just like a citizen as well until they get their paperwork, until they're done getting things done. Um, being treated like a criminal and you didn't do anything criminally is, is very inhumane to me. Um, kids and, and parents, understandably, even here, even us, as a regular scene of me, if I'm doing something illegal with my son in the car, we would be separated momentarily. Um, children's services, things like that. I, wor I work with the school district, so things like that are very fond of me, and I see it a lot. But there's a way to go about it. That's a child, and that is still a human being. We don't need to put children in cages and things like that to, to take away their, their mentality when it comes to life and humanity and seeing people and, and really damaging them for years for a few months or moments. Locally, on the local level, the only thing that I can do, which I've seen councilmen in my neighborhood do, which I would do is prevent ICE from coming into our neighborhoods. If parents are picking their kids up from schools, they're going to church, they're going to work, and interrupting their life, making that illegal for them to stop, pursue, or do anything like that in those areas and in, in those aspects. And then on the other hand, when it comes to help, I, I've worked with El Centro Pueblo for quite some time. And they have a program there where they have lawyers come in uh, every few days and help people fill out their paperwork as far as getting their, their stuff done because a lot of people that are immigrants, uh, they don't speak the language. So they need help when they get here in order to fill out their paperwork. And sometimes the reason why they're not taking care of their paperwork is because they don't really understand where to go and how to read the information that they're getting. So I, I would partake in reaching out to getting more resources to figure out how we can help the people that are here working extremely hard to try to make a living and, and become citizens extremely and then try to figure out on a local level if it was to keep either ice out of the neighborhoods or if they had to come in to the neighborhoods because this is a federal government law then we would try to do our best to stipulate hey they need to be treated humanely and if whatever laws don't apply to them absolutely do not need to apply to them so don't come in enforcing things that don't apply to us that's enforced on a government level you know for somebody who um has been you know, very new to politics, and I actually, I, I'm actually really enjoying this because you sound like you're, you're like everyone's dad. It's, it's <laughs> like that's what this sounds like. I'm, I'm just being honest. Like it's like, it's kind of like you know, that's someone here is doing something, and it's like, no, back away. I'm protecting my babies. So that's what it sounds like with you. That's what that's what the mentors around me. That's how they you know raised us. So mm -hmm. you just take the torch and you, you go ahead and run with it, and you do what they ask or what your ancestors would have dreamed and loved to see us doing at this point in time. They would love to see that you and I, as people of color, have the opportunity to voice our opinion and no one's doing anything or stopping us from doing that. So it's pretty thing. nice, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> so um, before we go, there's obviously going to be, you know, the one topic that always makes everything just so much harder these days, and that's this current pandemic we're right. in. Hopefully by 2022, we do see some differences, but as of right now, it seems very unlikely. and. Would you say that because of the current pandemic, it does make things so much harder on everyone as far as every other issue that we're facing right now? Oh, of course, uh, especially the homelessness in, in the area that we live in and, um, and the district that we're in, the homelessness is, has grown um, quite a bit since uh, COVID started. And then just, you know, hearing stories and seeing messages from friends that are dealing with landlords, giving them late notices and, you know, your friends aren't working and, and unemployment has jumped. You know, I think of, I believe another eight hundred thousand people this week filed, which we're supposed to be, you know, doing better. But the, the more we stop listening to scientists and doctors, the more we stop listening to social media and the conspiracies or the the messages or memes that aren't from people that are specialists, doctors or disease specialists, um, the better off we'll be. The the more that people start trusting the science and stop being bothered by wearing a mask for a few minutes throughout the day as you walk around, um, the better off we'll be. As you can see, the, the most protected, the most tested, the most um, 
secured, uh, whatever you want to call it, the president and his wife. And I, as I was coming in, a few more people um, associated with the, the president's staff um, was tested positive. For, so now I'm hoping that the people that were on the fence about believing if this was true, if it was fake or not, unfortunately, it had to be the president. And I hope he's okay. I hope his family's okay. But I hope it, it really resonates with people that didn't believe or were on the fence about, hey, I don't like wearing a mask, we're losing our control, um, we're losing jobs, the economy this, the economy that. At the end of the day, I mean, we've been here for quite some time, a lot of us that are, not us, but a lot of people that are making this noise about uncomfortability, and that goes back to a person of color. I mean, we've been uncomfortable for quite some time. So if you have to be uncomfortable for a few months due to a health crisis, I mean, I don't, I don't see that that should be a problem. But I, I do, even myself, deal with a tad bit of anxiety and a tad bit of like just sometimes I'm lost because there is so much uncertainty right now at the moment. So I can I can I can understand everyone's emotions, everyone's feelings and everyone's um, anxiety when it comes to Corona. Um, but I think we're in it, like you said, for probably another year or so. Definitely. I mean, I know even just here we're having to learn to adapt right. in the sense of you know, normally when we would do these interviews, we would be right next to each other. Now we are on opposite sides of the room. <laughs> so just to be able to do this and do this in a safe manner. Right. Um, and that is one thing that I am a strong, strong believer in that does need to be implemented a lot more right. because of the fact that COVID is so real and everything like that. And yes, people do need to go out in the public and I understand that completely. Right. But your safety and the safety of others, in my personal opinion, is and should be a top priority. Now, how do you feel about that? No, definitely should be. I, I'm, I'm in a situation where I work for a district and if they head back earlier than, than should or don't have the absolute right protocols and things like that, I might not be returning to work due to the fact that it's not safe. I mean, it's not safe not only for myself, it's not safe for the kids, and maybe whoever's at home around them that may have pre-existing conditions or just maybe at that age where it is, you know, um, more threatening to their life than anyone else. Um, on the other hand, I also don't want to be a person running for office, preaching health and safety, and then I'm going back to a district where they're not taking all the measures, protocols, and uh, guidelines that they should be as far as returning to um, um, personal contact, especially with youth. Um, the LASD is testing all of their teachers and their students that they're having returned. I think every other district in the, in the nation, you ask me, should do the same. If you can't test everyone before they go back, I don't think that's... Um, that's thinking about the health and safety of the kids, to be honest, so. And you really do sound like everyone's dad. I'm, no. telling, I'm telling you guys, <laughs> sound like everybody's dad, and you really do. Um, I which, I, which I definitely uh, find refreshing. I appreciate it. Um, and one thing, you know, with all of this craziness with COVID, what about the families and the parents who don't want to get their kids tested? They feel like they're infringing on their rights. How? How could we handle that? Okay. That one's tough for me. That, I don't, I don't, I don't want to make it a long answer, but um, this one may sound, this may be like the most direct answer or, or dialed in thing that, I, that I'm about as far as when it comes to vaccinations and receiving that, things like that. A lot of people don't realize how great of an invention vaccine, vaccines are. Um, it's the reason why most of the entire population in the world is healthy. It is absolutely the only reason why everyone here in the United States is absolutely healthy. If you, if you have certain vaccinations and you go to countries that they don't have uh, the, the same protocols of vaccinations we have, there's a, there's a possibility that you can go to that country and bring back um, an illness that we normally probably wouldn't have in our country because most of our citizens are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, vaccinations save and help, um, let's see, large populations. Mm -hmm. They can help countries, they can help um, cities, things like that. All the other things that we have medically, they're pretty local and they're pretty, pretty, uh, pretty much dialed in on certain things. Uh, anesthesia, um, operations, things like that. That helps an individual at that time. Mm -hmm. Anesthesia it helps one person. You admit it, you help that person. But when you give an entire country, an entire nation vaccination, you're preventing something from spreading in the entire world like we have right now. So if we would have known about coronavirus prior, we would have vaccination or a form of treatment for it, like we do for chicken pox, um, measles, you name it. Um, so I, I, I believe in vaccinations, as odd as that may sound. 
Now, I think a lot of people don't believe in it, especially people of color and especially African Americans, because there was something that, there was an experiment done with us, which was the T Tuskegee Project, which was they injected syphilis into African Americans and they wanted to see the, the ramifications, the development and the process of that disease form inside of the human body. Now, the funny thing about that is the disease lasts, the experiment lasted for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the, to the black community, that's their fear. So it's not so much the vaccine, it's more of, hey, this has been done with our community before. They were telling us it was something else. Mm -hmm. And now when you do it again, now how's that community gonna feel again about asking them to take a vaccine? So I, I think that's where, where the divide comes in. But I'd like to tell people that if you're giving, California has 39 million people. Mm -hmm. If you give 39 million people a vaccine, and unfortunately, 500,000 people out of those 39 million get sick or develop things and blah, blah, blah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that's a successful vaccination. It's saved more than 98% of the, the population. So it's touchy. Um, I, I would advise people to get it, but I wouldn't advise people to get it immediately. Right. Yeah, I'd wait until. Oh yeah, for yeah, sure. I completely yeah. agree with you there. Now, um, but while that is just, you know, with vaccinations, that's still a long way off. My current focus right now is, you know, when people going back to schools, they want to implement, you know, people getting COVID testings, you know, on a regular basis. Yeah, right. And a lot of parents do feel like it is inappropriate. And that's why we are seeing so much of, you know, schooling from home, but obviously everyone wants our lives to go back to normal, right. but some people don't want to do the things that many districts feel is necessary to get us there, like regular COVID testing. Yeah, and stuff like that is weird because there's people, I, and I test my friends a lot about this, like I have friends that they don't really believe in vaccinations, they don't believe in things like that, they don't believe in the message that it brings or whatnot, and it's funny because those same people, if they were to get sick or their kids were to get sick, I can almost guarantee you that the doctors where they're going to end up, and there may be things that the doctors have to do to you or your children to keep you alive, and I'm pretty sure when you call the doctor and you call an ambulance that you're not too concerned about what vaccinations you get at that moment if something's happening with your child. So with that being said, I mean, it's a personal choice. It absolutely is, but I don't, I don't see why you can take a kid to go get other things done to them, but you're afraid to just, it's only a test. It's not even an injection. Don't get me wrong. It's not that great. I've had it done. No. <laughs> it will go up in my nose. It is. Lord, sweet Jesus, oh my God, uh, I remember I was crying because like, it's a good thing I didn't have on makeup that day because yeah. it would have been, okay. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it's touchy, but I mean, at the end of the day, you have to do a bunch of things to get, to get screened or, or go through checkups and it's not comfortable. Um, I was always told if you take medicine when I was little, I, I, I hated taking some medicines like we all do. And I liked taking the medicines that were kind of good. And my mom and dad and grandma would always tell me, you can take those, but they're not really gonna work. They taste good. And that means there's not much medicine in it. So I get it, I get it. And it's touchy. So it's, it's solely on the individual and on the family and on the parents. Awesome. Well, Clay, thank you so much for being here with me. I know I kind of grilled you a little bit, but it's because, you know, we were, we're here to get to know you. Mm -hmm. And before we go, I want you to do one more thing for me. Okay. I want you to look in that camera and I want you to tell people why they should vote for you. Okay. So my name is Clay Johnston. I'm running for 2022, uh, 13th District, City of Los Angeles. You should vote for me due to the fact that I'm not a politician. So I'm actually somebody who cares and actually walks, lives, and communicates and is interactive with the community. Now, that's your choice, whoever you want to vote on, but if you're tired of politics, you're tired of politicians putting on suits like I have on now, I'm uncomfortable. So if you want a guy that's comfortable in the suit, he's probably comfortable about getting his hands dirty and getting in the community and actually doing something about the people in his community and care about the community. I'm someone that was born and raised in the community. Even if I wasn't, I would still care because I care about people. Now, I'm not big on looking in a camera and telling you why you should vote for me. I'm more about the action. So if you go ahead and follow me, or if you keep up with my name, or you keep up with my campaign, you'll actually see all the work that I've actually done already in the community that I've never put out because that's not the type of personality that I am. But getting used to this, this is something that's new to me. I hope you guys can understand the uncomfortability, but there's still the want for you to believe in all of the platforms that I do. So appreciate you, thank you, and uh, get out and vote. 
Awesome. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, I know that this isn't our typical normal, but with the upcoming election, it's definitely important for us to try to get as informed as possible. And Clay, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate your time, even though it is in a, in a new way. Right, right. Um, it is still in a way where we can be able to get our public informed as much as possible. So for all of you guys, I'm Vanessa with Reventonimas and Sabor Latino, and we will see you guys next time.